Today's ReadWoke program is a conversation with author, Afro-minimalist, and racial justice advocate Christine Platt. Platt has written several early reader book series, including Anna and Andrew, and contributed to other history-based children's book series, including She Rose and The History of Books. She has also worked with Dr. Ibram Kendi to make the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center a reality at American University, where she continues to serve as the managing director. Platt also writes and blogs about Afro-minimalism and will have a new book coming out on the topic in June this year. I love working with young people and and I love um, doing that through literature, right? I mean, I think storytelling is, I mean, that's one of my taglines is like storytelling for social change because, you know, stories have just such power to teach, right? Like we, we get educated from our from stories. We are able to experience other cultures and uh, places through our literature, right? Like there's so many things that we can do with storytelling that um, you know that can that can sort of break through some of these challenges that we have in terms of race in this country. group is so important and I think what's 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 probably what I see as the biggest thing the biggest part of the work that I'm doing with these stories is that I'm teaching history and lived experiences through joy so I think that oftentimes what we get when we are you know excuse me teaching young people about marginalized communities and other experiences and other histories right it's always coming from this place of trauma and sadness right and it's like no, like we can teach through joy. Like getting to understand that like someone who is, um, you know, from let's say, I don't know, we can even just say Mexico, right? Like the fact that they would want to teach their child about carnival, right? And the similarities between our cultures, right? And being able to teach that and and also understanding that there are people in Mexico that are this brown, right? Like, so getting getting children to see, see themselves on the page. And then every story, like, teaches history. So this is The Magic Violin. The story teaches about Frederick Douglass, which I love. And this story is pretty fun because um, it's loosely based off the experience. My daughter plays the violin and she's actually going to be going to music school for composition at the museum, teaches about African-American history and culture, folks who visit the museum. And some of these stories, which is so fun, especially this one, which was the first book that I wrote in the series. I had parents reach out to me and they said, oh my goodness, we read that book. And my child was like, we have to go to that museum. I have to go to that, right? I get like pictures of kids in front of the museum for books and it's just to me like that is important work uh, one of the books going to ghana teaches um you know this age group about slavery right and it's to go to visit um one of the slave dungeons in ghana and just really talking about this history and like getting just getting that language and normalizing it now right Mm -hmm. so that others can expand and build upon that history and knowledge over time right like you shouldn't be hearing about slavery or learning about slavery for the first time in the fifth grade i have to tell you one of the sweetest I got was of this little boy. He was so cute. Little redhead, like as white as white could be. Red hair, blue eyes, right? And he's holding this, he's holding one of the Annie and Andrew books. And his mom said, all he kept saying was, oh my God, Andrew is just like me. Oh my gosh, we like the same things, right? And so like, that's the connection that I want to make 
with young people, right? Like getting them to understand like, yes, your skin color might be different. Your hair color might be different. Your, but you are both human and you love to do the same things. Why should you not be friends? Why should you not get along? Why should this not be someone that you are open to having a conversation with or playing with, right? Like, so that's for me, like being able to do that with this age group is just so powerful. And it just sets the tone and the pace for again, the rest of their life, right? And then it's up to their parents and educators and the people around them to just continue to build and expand upon that knowledge. I feel like <laughs> it's, it's, it's not funny, but it actually, it, it is kind of comical because whenever I get this question, it's like, it's so easy thinking of my age, right? We didn't have a lot of diverse stories. And so the only book where I remember seeing myself is Corduroy. It's the only book where I saw myself. It didn't mean that I didn't read other stories. I was obsessed with like Little House on the Prairie and the Babysitter's Club and like, all, you know, all this sort of traditional stories. Um, but there's something about seeing yourself on the page. And I read Corduroy until it fell apart. You know, Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop, she talks about books being windows, mirrors, and sliding glass doors, right? And I think depending on your age, um, you probably read more window books than you care to because you didn't have a choice. And that's what happened to me. I was always peeking into the lives of someone else and, and just being like, wow, they get to live. But I never got to see myself. And there's something that is absolutely powerful about seeing yourself on the page, especially as an early reader. Um, you know, I, I, I would hear from parents, they'll say like, oh my God, my kid never loved reading until we got Anna and Andrew. And I'm like, yeah, they probably just are excited to see themselves on the page, right? Like that's the thing, right? And so having um, books where you can see yourself represented um, you know, encourages your love for reading. At a certain point, you start wondering, why am I not seeing myself? Why are my stories not important enough to be in a book that my class is reading? Why is my history a history that is not shared in the same way that some of these other histories are shared, right? And on the flip side of that, which is, is which is what we rarely talk about, is how some of these prejudices and biases and you know stereotypes are formed, right? If you are a young child and you are constantly seeing yourself represented in a book and not seeing others, you are naturally going to think that you are superior in some way or that your stories are more important than other people's stories because your stories are the stories that are always being told, right? And so getting people to understand that, yes, representation is important for the mirror, right? So for people to see themselves, but it's also equally important for the window sliding glass doors piece, right? Because you don't want to start reinforcing um, you know, this white supremacy culture that we live in, right? I mean, like, let's just call it what it is, right? And so when you don't have diverse literature, what you are doing is continuing to perpetuate these stereotypes and this belief that these are the only stories that matter. Or when you teach, uh, when you do have a diverse uh, book and all it's teaching or showing is trauma, you know, struggle, hardship, right? That is that is also a diverse book that is reinforcing stereotypes. It, and it doesn't mean that those stories don't need to be told, but those are not the only stories that need to be told. Same way we show, you know, a range of perspectives and experiences with white stories, that is the same way we show with diverse literature. biggest thing is making sure that the diverse stories I think own voices is so important so that's like a big thing for me right um, I think 
having these stories that are told from someone who looks like the characters that are in the story, who understands the characters who are in the story. And it, it plays a big role, even, even in, um, even in like, um, illustrations, right? So getting, I, I was like, it's really important for me that these children not be racially ambiguous. I know racially ambiguous, you know, books sell really well. However, I need Anna and Andrew to be little black boys, right? Like I need their hair to be curly. I need there to be flyaways. I need like, and those are things <laughs> that um, a white writer may not even take into consideration because they don't understand how powerful just having another layer of brown is on those children and what an impact that can make on the community um, that's that's going to be reading them. They don't understand how, you know, it's important that all of Anna's hair doesn't always get into that ponytail <laughs> because, right, like that is what happens with little black girls they're playing they're having fun their little curls come out right like it and those things are so important because you also want children to see accurate representations of themselves there's definitely a lack of black um children's literature but it's even uh worse when it comes to indigenous um, children's literature and I feel like especially here in America you know that it's such an important part of our history um, the fact that it is not included um, and respected and like it's just it's it's very it's always been very upsetting for me um, and so I would love to see more indigenous stories um, and more indigenous stories told by indigenous writers um, and they are out there and they're writing beautiful stories. Um, you know, I think multiracial stories are also very, very important, right? Like our uh, society is, is very multiracial. Um, and I think that's only going to continue um, to be a part of our history. And so, um, you know, I'd love to see more, more multiracial stories, I think would be um, super important. And, um, you know, just, just again, less stories that are from uh, places of sadness and pain and suffering and more from places of joy.